Hello, welcome to Only For Your Ears and today's episode 24. Before I introduce the name of the episode, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the people that have spent time viewing this channel. Now we'll proceed with the rest of the episode. Today's episode is called The Girl Who Trod on a Loaf. And I've renamed it as Vanity Kills the Bird. We're going to start off with a typical structure, as always, using the summary and I'll highlight the most important points. Then we'll move on to my critical review on how this fairy tale parallels in today's parallels in today's society. And I'll use sentences from the summary to frame my review. And third, we'll talk about the trigger points, the triggers that affected me. Let's begin. The girl who trod on a loaf and vanity kills the bird. The girl that trod on a loaf is a Hans Christian Handerson fairy tale about a proud and vain girl named Inge. Inge is known for her vanity, selfishness and disdain for those less fortunate than her. I digress. This is similar to what society is still going through today. Look at the 1% and their wealth. One day, her mother sends her to her aunt's house with a loaf of bread as a gift. On her way there, Inge encounters a muddy puddle. To avoid dirtying her shoes, she replaces the loaf of bread on the mud and steps on it. I digress. That's an abomination. Doesn't this spoiled, wretched girl know how priceless a loaf of bread was back in the day? So here's the reflection. A critique of social hierarchies. Anderson's tell could be interpreted as a critique of the social hierarchies and class distinctions that existed in his time, but they still exist today. Although it's perceived as uncouth, we try to hide it with sophistication. Inge's desire to appear superior to others leads to her downfall, suggesting that the pursuit of social status and the trappings of wealth are ultimately empty and unfulfilling. Yes, although this is true, but there is a divide between old money and new money. Old money is considered better because of its longevity. The loaf sinks into the ground, pulling Inge in with it. I digress. Good that she didn't put up a fight. She falls into a nightmarish underworld. I digress. This is where she belongs, which is where her thinking mentality came from. Where she is confronted by various creatures and tormented by visions of the pain she has caused others. I digress again. Unfortunately, she's reaping what she sowed. The, appar the apparitions reveal her past misdeeds and the consequences of her actions on those around her. I digress. Everybody has a shadow side to them where we are forced to face the results of what we did. Reflection. The consequences of pride and arrogance. My goodness, this is interesting because I heard this morning that whenever you feel pride, one should look at each person that they come across as being a part of themselves. And that will eliminate that prideful attitude. I think I agree with that. Why are pride and arrogance so present? The false sense of superiority is not confidence. The story highlights the dangers of excessive pride and arrogance. 
Inge's desire to appear better than others led her to step on the love, resulting in her punishment. This can be interpreted as a reminder to remain humble and not let vanity cloud our judgments or actions. The reason Inge wants to appear better to be poor is considered a death sentence in society. Yes, it most definitely is. So this is what this is the reason why it's so much better to appear to appear as though you're better than everybody else, because society looks down at the working class. We're downtrodden people. Inge's heart is filled with remorse. And she begins to repent. I digress. She has realized what her past actions symbolize. She prays for forgiveness and mercy. And with each sincere prayer, she rises closer to the surface. I digress. She's experienced the process of her sincerity after a long period of suffering and repentance. I digress again. Patience is long-suffering. Inge is finally released from the underworld, having learned the importance of humility and compassion and the consequences of her actions. Bravo! God's love and mercy. Final reflection. The importance of compassion and kindness. Inge's lack of of compassion and kindness towards others contributes to her downfall by disregarding the needs of those around her. She ultimately ends up suffering. The story emphasizes the value of treating others with respect and empathy. We live in a world full of hard skilled people. And when this happens, the lack of empathy is very dominant because sensitivity, compassion, and empathy are considered weak and superficially feminine traits. traits. Yes, we still live in a world that honors misogynistic rule of thumb. I think this is a really good story. And I think this story, more than most of them that I have read and talked about really reflects and talks about the parallels of today's society quite beautifully because we still have a really strong strong class and status status problem in our society wanting to appear so superior to other people and at the same time having no empathy just lacking empathy wherever you go and you know people it's really easy to have a lack of empathy sometimes you just have that lack of empathy because you say I don't want to be like that person and so you you push them to the side and you push them down let's take a look at my critical review my critical review on how this fairy tale plays in society well, I must say this fairy tale really hits home to my British roots. It most definitely does. As you know, a certain fraction of the English love the royal family, status and class system. For example, I'm a working class woman who rose to middle class levels because of my mother's second marriage. But as much as the Brits pride themselves as sophisticated people who are above such rituals as a class system, the old structure is indelible, even in today's society. Let's take a look at some examples from the summary. The Girl Who Trod on the Loaf is a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale about a proud and vain girl named Inge. Inge is known by her vanity, selfishness, and disdain for those less fortunate than her. I digress. This is similar to what society is still going through today. Look at 
the 1% and their wealth, I am reminded of the five billionaires in the Titanic submarine that, that, imp that imploded under sea. Why on earth did they invest all this money to take in a look at a, a, a felled vessel that sunk uh, over, a, over a century ago? Just because they could. This money could have been invested in homeless people and housing or really important causes to help society or the planet. But this is the same narcissistic behavior of selfish, self-centered one percent that have nothing better to do than take dangerous risks so they can capture the spotlight for what painter Andy Warhol described as 15 minutes of fame. Well, they certainly got their 15 minutes of fame uh, during their untimely death. Number two, I'm also reminded of Jane Fonda's thoughtfulness when she brought hot food for the American Indians during the pipeline dispute in North Dakota on indigenous land. I hope you remember that one on indigenous territory. This is night and day example for how very rich actors and five billionaires choices. Society is obsessed with the superficial need to compete with and beat the next person with their money just to feel important. For example, Sir Richard Branson arrived to the Earth's atmosphere during the summer, I can't remember, was it summer of 2021? I think it was. This had been actually his lifelong dream. I know a little bit about Richard Branson and he's always been what you consider the odd ball. He never fit into society. So he, he created his own world. And he always wanted to do this. I mean, he created Virgin Airlines. He's, he has his wonderful island in the West Indies. But he's created his, his own life because he never fitted in. And th one of, this is one of the things that he always wanted to do. And no sooner had Richard pronounced his idea, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk decided to jump in and compete. Let me compete with the learned British who has always wanted to do this. Let me see if I can get there before he does. Not because they even really wanted to, I mean, granted, Elon Musk is interested in this type of things as well. But if it wasn't if it if it wasn't for Richard Branson mentioning this, they wouldn't have had the incentive to do it. I digress again. Unfortunately, she's reaping what she sowed. The apparitions revealed reveal her past misdeeds and the consequences of her actions on those around her. The first thought that comes to mind is that not everybody gets to reap what they sow. A sense of deflated, a sense of a deflated gut sunk well beneath the surface for me upon reflecting this thought. While this is true, it's true in the Bible through agriculture because of the law of cause and effect that most people get to reap, or most things get to reap what they sow. My blood father, for example, had an affair with a woman he later married soon after his divorce from my mother. Well, divorce was, after the divorce from my mother was final. He lacked interest in his relationship with both my sister and me. And he preferred his stepchildren in comparison to us, he couldn't bear my mother in all the in all intensive purposes. 
she was a, like a malignant narcissist. Yes, she was. This is true. So who would want to stay married to a malignant narcissist? However, when she was about 53, she met John, a draftsman who worked for the British press. He was a wonderful man and he treated my mother like a queen, which is far better than what her first husband did. Which is something she absolutely adored. Of course, she enjoyed being treated like a queen, especially being a narcissist as well. God knows my father did, didn't deserve this. I believe my mother was far better off though than what my blood father could could have ever given her. So he may have gotten the divorce that he wanted through nefarious means, but I feel my dad wasn't happy financially, but just plodded along with the status quo in the West Indies. A dancer friend of mine was the group's favorite at college but turned out to be this quiet bitch, standing me in the back, in the dark. Unfortunately, I unfortunately really wanted her to accept and like me because I, I've always been the black sheep and not liked sheep and not liked. Well, there was a lot of jealousy towards me. Well, this is a situation where somebody reaped what they sowed and my mother actually mentioned it June was uh, considered the favourite there were three three black girls in this on this course in London at the Laban Centre and I was of course the one that they decided they didn't like, I didn't fit in at all and June was the one that was closer to who they could relate to. And Natalie was considered closer to who they could relate to. They couldn't relate to me. I thought I was a bit too different and I stood out and etc. Well, one day, I mean, I, I knew that she didn't like me, but I wanted her to like me because I didn't want to be on the receiving end of whatever she was going to give me. And everybody adored her. June, 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 June. Oh, she's so nice. She's so nice. She's so nice. <laughs> so much better than you, Melody, basically saying, you know, I'm the one that they just didn't like. But it had to do with jealousy, envy, competition, all of these things. But I, I didn't realise until much later on. Anyway, we used to go to this art, creative arts centre on Sunday and Monday evenings and on Monday one Monday evening we were leaving the Laban Center and we were crossing Goldsmiths no not Goldsmiths College we were crossing the uh, New Cross Gate and I was standing by the <clears throat> pardon me I was standing by the the curb the edge and June was never a touchy person all of a sudden, this dragonaut came spitting, coming by very, very fast, and the dirt flashed up in my face. And she, because she had, she had leaned on my back, and I kind of fell into the street, but bounced back. And just as I fell into the street, the lorry or the dragonaut just missed me. And I looked at her, and she goes, "Oh, sorry." But she wasn't sorry at all. She was a total, a, a total flat out jealous bitch. To be quite honest. And I thought, you know, if if only they knew who she really was. But maybe they did know who she really was, and they, and they didn't care. They were they were happy that she could do to me what they probably wanted to do. And I couldn't say anything to anybody. But anyway, when I came home that night, I told my mother. And she said, you know something, I told you that there's that jealousy there that she has towards you. And she will reap what she sows. Well, I didn't believe it at first. And then 
a couple months later, I think we had to do, it was the end of year performance. It was our final performance. And um, just before the final performance, we had to do dress rehearsals and stuff like that. And we we all, we finished dancing and they took the lights went out and they always said that you have to be careful when the lights go out. You have to walk off stage, don't run off stage. Anyway, she ran and she hit into one of her one of her one of her admirers that absolutely adored her. They smacked eyes and they both had to have stitches. And they went to the hospital and everything and got stitches. I got into trouble a little bit because she was supposed to come to my house and her mother called her up, called up my house and I said, oh, uh, June isn't here because she would stay at somebody else's house after she went to the went to the hospital. June isn't here because, um, but I didn't say that. What I said was, she asked me where June is and I said, oh, she isn't here. She's gone to rehearsal. She says, Melody, you, you should tell me the truth because if she if she's somewhere else, I'm going to be really angry with you. And so I ended up telling her the truth. <coughs> but I said, she, she's absolutely fine. So I got into trouble because the school was like really angry that I actually told the truth. I said, I, there's nothing else that I could do. She was insisting that I do that. So that's what I did. But in the, on the other hand, I got blamed for one thing, but on the other hand, she did reap what she sowed. <clears throat> so that was the situation. Sorry for my sore throat, people. Okay, so let's move on to the last one. Inga's heart is filled with remorse and she begins to repent. I digress. She has realised what her past actions symbolize. She prays for forgiveness and mercy. And with each sincere prayer, she rises closer to the surface. I digress. She's experiencing the process of her, instant, uh, of her sincerity after a long period of suffering and repentance. I digress. Patience is long suffering. Inge is finally released from the underworld. Inge is, has, is reaping what she sowed as she sunk into the underworld. And she is immediately, as she immediately started repenting because she realized that she what she had done, I believe she didn't want to experience the ramifications of her actions. I'm drawn to a very hurtful situation in my childhood. I picked up a hammer when I was angry. Now, let me tell you the situation. My sister was basically a, a darn right bully and she hated me and she's always hated me. I've been, I'm the youngest. I'm apparently the fairest. I'm quite lighter, light skinned in comparison to her dark skin. And I might be considered a little bit more attractive than her or glamorous than her. But to be quite honest, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And my sister has never been short of male attention. So I just wanted to get that out. And she bullied me a lot. I mean, my sister was always people's favourites at school, in the family, period. Well, she used to love throwing she sometimes she'd throw a plate at me and it hit me in my head the 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 bump on my head is still there but it's not as strong as it used to be but she used to like hitting me in my head and I, I hated it and then one day she did it and I just got so mad and I, I I ended up picking up a hammer I didn't mean to pick up a hammer I didn't want to pick up a hammer but I just wanted to, I, I wanted her to stop and I wanted to be able to defend myself. But in defending myself, I picked up something that I shouldn't have done. And I was excoriated. 
I had shamed about it. It didn't matter that she was hitting me in my head and causing all types of abuse. That didn't matter. What mattered is that I picked up a hammer, but I did not hit her with it, but I picked it up. I, I just felt I've had enough of her abuse. And my mother said, you wait until your father gets home. So I had to wait six hours to get a horrible beating. As if to say, well, what you did was disgusting. What I did, I was trying to defend myself. And this is what I learned. I learned that when I defended myself, it was a terrible thing because I would get beaten. And this is what I learned in my household. I could have been told off about it and said that was really wrong, that you could have really hit your sister with that and it was violent. But her abusive actions, she wasn't accounted for it. So I, I understand what it's like when you do something and you do something wrong and it's impulsive, but you you just want somebody to stop hitting you and you pick up a, a horrible instrument that I didn't hit her with. I, I just had it in my hand. I said, I've had enough. And you don't want to bear the fr horrible fruit, the rotten fruit and the ramifications of your actions, but you end up having to do it. And my goodness, I heard my dad come in and I just said, oh my God. Here it goes. I mean, I spent the whole day feeling awful. And of course, my hateful narcissistic mother just like loved the fact that I was just so scared. She was quite awful, but I'd I'd I do not I d I d I don't I don't feel anything about her now, really. It's a waste of time. Let's move on to the trigger points. What I found most triggering. So the trigger points. The girl who trod on a loaf of bread, again, is a Hans Christian Anderson fairy tale about a proud, vain girl named Inge. Inge is known for her vanity, selfishness, and disdain for those less fortunate than her. I digress. This is similar to what society is still going through today. Look at the 1% and their wealth. The copycat attitude from Jeff Bezos as and Elon Musk rushed to reach the Earth's atmosphere made my skin crawl. This is the typical competitive thing. Oh, you've done it. You think you can do it? Well, I can do better than you. You know, just this kind of silly, childish thing. And you know something? They didn't really even want to do it. I think Jeff Bezos cancelled his and I think with Elon Musk it wasn't that much of a success at all so it just goes to show that they were doing it without the best intentions it was just to compete it reminded me of what I've experienced so much in my life the cutthroat competition competition with people's need to outdo me when I'm not competing with them. The need to put people down so the creator feels bad about the very creation that the thief wants to steal and claim to be their idea. Boy, did my blood boil at the thought of this idea because I've allowed some stupid things to take place in my life because I've always felt unworthy as an artist, living my life like a slave to people's approval. Just because the intellectuals didn't know how to understand what I was doing on an emotional and spiritual level. Sometimes we're not supposed to understand something, but simply experience it. And through the experience, we are sometimes able to reach our own understanding of what we have witnessed. Well, in the 90s, I created a dance called Shush, It's a Secret. It was loosely based on the sexual assault I experienced when I was living in New York City. And I had entered a choreographer's showcase from this workshop. 
and there were two women choreographers. Now, for the performance, I was put in first pos position. So I was going to start the evening out and then somebody was put at, at the end. And these two women, they were white women, uh, good choreographers, but they were white women. And they felt, they decided to play a mind game with me. And they did it oh so beautifully and very well. They sort of said, oh, your piece is so sad. Your piece is so, you know, dark. Your piece is X, Y, and Z. And because I, I felt so unsure of myself and I was still gullible and still believed, you know, that white people knew everything. They had the perfect bodies. They had the perfect everything. And so they were superior. And of course, they knew what they were talking about. So I listened to what they had to say. And then we all got in a circle. We all started talking about, you know, how the program's going to go. And I said, you know something, I think I'll change my mind. I think, you know... I know that I'm supposed to be first on, but why don't these two women go first and I get put into second place? And they started laughing because they was like, well, we got what we wanted. We got what we wanted. And I felt, and the person that was heading up the whole show said, oh God, you know, and it's like she's made the decision. So let her, let her go ahead with it. And then afterwards, a couple of people that I told after I'd done the sh performance, uh, at home I, I I spoke to this person at home and I said that I gave them you know my spot and I took second position she said why did you do that melody I know why I did it I allowed myself to be bullied by these two white girls yes who claim that they know everything in fact when I was at the first doing this piece first choreographing this piece I had another white woman turn around and say to me I don't think you understand your own piece of choreography. What kind of nonsense is that? People turn pain into art all the time. And not everybody understands everything, including them. And I, I, I never forgot that. And then after I had finished doing that performance, I forgot on all about what I had done and what I wanted to forget all about it. And I sort of didn't remember. And then this guy, this white guy came up to me and he goes, I saw your performance. I said, what? He goes, I saw your performance of, um, sure, she's the secret. He says it was so engaging. It was most engaging. I loved it. I said, oh, thank you. Now, I always have, I have always gone by this idea, if a piece is good and it can stand by itself, it doesn't matter whether it's in first position, second or third, fourth or fifth, it really doesn't matter. And when he said that to me, I realized that he was he was standing with my unspoken sentiments. So I feel bad about what I did, but I realized why I did what I did. And this reminded me of me buckling, falling under the pressure of people's competitiveness and what, comp what competitive people will do. I, I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Part of it, instead of standing with the integrity of the piece. Now let's go on to the next trigger. So that really triggered me. And what's, uh, I have to mention something else. It, this triggered me, but what's most interesting is that I no longer seek out other people's approval. 
as much as I used to. I, in fact, I very rarely do. My cousin in the United States said, oh, send me your podcast. I'll, I'll listen to it. I'll give you a, a heads up. I'll tell you what, you know, maybe needs to be worked on, give you some feedback. And I found myself thinking, I don't really want your approval. Number one, I don't particularly like you that much anyway. And number two, I don't care about your approval. I did not say that, but I felt it. So I know I've come a really long way from that very triggering experience that I had in the early 90s. Second trigger. To avoid dirty in her shoes, she places the loaf of bread on the mud and steps on it. I digress. This is an abomination. Doesn't this spoiled, wretched girl know how priceless a loaf of bread is? The first thing I want to, to talk about is religion because her original sin is that the bread represents the body of Christ. And when she stepped on the bread to protect her shoes, this is like the ultimate This is this is like this is like the ultimate insert in, uh, insult. And she, bread back in the day was just so priceless. She has no idea, none. Bread back in the day was so priceless, and it, of course, it's also the body of Christ. And so she's, number one, she doesn't care about the, the the price and the hard work that it took to make this bread. And number two, she couldn't care less about Christ. So that it, was a two, it was a double sword insult. If she had been spirit filled, she would have asked God for her protection or Jesus Christ. The second insult is that back in the day, a loaf of bread was considered second to roasted chicken for most people. Sometimes people that come from a certain class don't appreciate the humble treasures of their parents' generation. I am reminded of the great Omantia Ortega that comes from the country that I've resided in for almost 20, well, more than 23 years. Uh, Barcelona, Spain. He actually comes from Galicia. He's the, uh, I think he's the, he's the founder and former chairman of Inditex Fashion. And he grew up in Galicia with his wife. They work together as seamstress or seamstress, they call them. He made suits, she made dresses, tops and etc. It's, it's a real family business. And they were poor. They were just poor and they just started to work, work of this fashion. And together they became Zara. And today they have, uh, they have, I think they have one daughter. I can't remember her name, but she is incredibly spoiled and has very little regard for the privileges that's bestowed upon her. She's not privy, she's, and she's not privy to the fact that her parents really had to work hard. She, I don't think she's really aware of how hard they had to work and how they had to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And I guess her parents, don't want to remind her of that and sort of say, you know, we, we had to work really hard for what you're taking for granted. But she's incredibly spoiled, incredibly spoiled and probably incredibly vain. And the last one is, I digress. She has realized what her past actions symbolize. She prays for forgiveness and mercy. And with each sincere prayer, she rises closer to the surface. I'm reminded of when I was nine years old. And I went to Jamaica for the first time to see my, my grandmother. 
talk about spoiled and privileged. Well, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything except for what we had in England. And what I had in England, our family had in England, seemed like a palace in comparison to what my grandmother had. I felt really bad. We moved into what we could, what she, she had a hut, basically. That's all she had. That's all she could afford. One bed, a hut, a table and a chair, maybe, and that's it. And I remember thinking, where's the central heating? Well, number one, that was stupid of me to say that because you're in the West Indies. It's Christmas time. You don't need central heating. And number two, I didn't like her food. I didn't like her cooking. I didn't like the peanut cake. It was very, very sugary. sugary. Oh, lots and lots and lots and lots of sugar. And I feel really bad that I didn't appreciate all that she had to offer. So I can really sympathize with this girl on one in one respect because it reminds me of me. I did not appreciate my grandmother and what she had to offer. It's really sad. And I feel, honestly, people, I feel really embarrassed about this particular situation. So why the title Vanity Kills the Bird? Well, Vanity Kills the Bird because if we're so self-centered and so preoccupied with what we see on the outside, we never get to develop the beauty of who we are on the inside. And that's why they say vanity kills the bird. Well, we're finished for today. I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. I appreciate you. I, I love your response when you do respond. And I'd love for you to share, like, give me a thumbs up, show me some love and subscribe when you can. Subscribe today if you can or Give me a thumbs up. That would be great. I'll see you next week. And I'll leave you with a typical expression. Healing is a lifelong gift, lesson and blessing we give ourselves, mind, body and soul. Healing is a lifelong gift, blessing and lesson we give ourselves, mind, body and soul. Take care, people. Love you. Goodbye.